So a reminder, there's no final in this class. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to try and uh, get onto the IRC here first. Make sure research tools. Today we're going to cover some stuff that's a little bit different for starters. We're going to begin just talking about copyright. It's an unfortunate topic that if you don't do it right, you can walk yourself into some real trouble where your material might not be usable by other people. And then we'll, if we get some time, we'll talk about uh, going through the KML section and a little bit of SQL, writing our SBET files out. And that's the end of the class. So there's a lot of stuff I would have liked to have covered. We didn't quite get to it, but hopefully the time we spent on the material you have here, you have a little bit better sense of Python and things like that. We spent more time on that than the, that I was sort of planning in the beginning, but I think that it was worth the time to dig into it a little bit more than we would have otherwise. And then hopefully that provides a good basis for you all to go about learning lots of other stuff. I want to start off with a reminder that with this material for the class, I encourage copying. I'm giving you all permission to copy, modify, change, do whatever you want with this class material, the videos, the audio. Basically, I've given you permission to use this stuff any way you like, modify it. Uh, I would love it if anybody sends me changes, if you find improvements or write up sections that I don't have content for, whatever, I will happily put them into the notes and update them on the material site. The idea of this is that this class isn't done when you leave here. Research tools is sort of a lifelong thing and that you'll be learning stuff as you go. What we learn here isn't the end all be all of research tools, it's just my particular take on all this material. So I'll try and post more videos as we... And let's jump into copyright. It's very important to note this very first warning. I am not a lawyer. However, most lawyers know little about software, data, copyright patent issues. And this topic is kind of boring, but it's really, really important. For example, at UNH here, I was putting up videos on YouTube. I was on travel. I got a call from a UNH lawyer, and he said, get everything off of YouTube right now. Take it all down. And, yow. I didn't know what in the world was going on. I didn't know why. It took me several hours of sitting down with the UNH lawyer to get the right to put all my content back up. They didn't understand the law. They thought there was all kinds of weird things going on, and we had to sit down and work through some really ugly issues in terms of legal stuff. We had to get the point where the lawyers understood that I was allowed to put up YouTube videos and that other faculty and students are allowed to put up YouTube videos. One of those, like, this seems pretty obvious, but until the lawyers agree, you don't necessarily get to do what you want. And there's a lot of stuff that lawyers can do to get in your way. They can also help you out. And anything you see in here that I talk about with copyright, before you act on it legally, you should talk to your lawyer. That's the cover my ass part of it. I put a link into the US copyright PDF that you can read, but it actually has some good information in it. Some of the laws here are different than other countries, but a lot of people at the US have gone out into the world and forced US copyright law on a lot of other countries. So typically things here actually apply a lot of other places. The key thing to remember, if you don't give somebody copyright permission somehow, if you don't explicitly give somebody a license to use what you write, be it an email or otherwise, they don't have the legal right to use what you do. So if you create something that is copyrightable, a painting, a picture, software, something you write, they don't have the rights to use it. Even if you don't have a copyright sign on it, if you don't say C or do all that stuff, by creating it in a fixed medium, be it email or putting it into a file, that's a fixed medium. And unless you're a US government employee, which some of you have to deal with that aspect, you have the copyright to that, or your employer has the copyright to that. We've actually run into some pretty serious problems with this. If someone says something is open source or public domain, and they just tell you that, it doesn't mean anything. So you actually need to get a license to something from someone else if you want to use some code or their writings or data that they've generated. And if you want to give your stuff to other people to use, say you're collaborating on some code, you need to be very clear and pick a license of some sort and write that down. And that will then allow people to work together and use their material. 
So for example, in my class notes, I've made it a Creative Commons license, and I had to pick a, pick a particular one. I've got a link here. If you really are insistent on public domain, if you're a federal employee, your stuff might fall under public domain inside the US. But you can try to use this link to make your stuff public domain. I suggest not trying to do that, because public domain is very confusing for anything after, I think, it's 1972. OpenSource.org has got a whole web page on talking about open source licenses. And this group actually goes through licenses and tries to uh, evaluate them for you. So if you're looking for a license, this is a place to start. I'll give you my quick recommendations in a second here. But these guys have a whole list of open source licenses by name. And you can go through and read lots of legalese. And I want to show you an example of something that went wrong. So don't. You don't need to type in this code. I just did it and threw it in the notes so you could see. GSF, the generic sensor format, is a format used by a lot of sonar vendors. People are, are thinking of it as a standard way to transfer information between software and vendors. If you've got sonar data coming off of one particular hardware and need to get it somewhere else, if you convert it to GSF, then it might be portable or more portable to get your data around. GSF is written by a company called SAIC. And they're under contract with the Navy. However, they don't post the contract, so we don't know the details of what's said there. So if you go and grab the source code, which is in Keras and HiPack and MB System and lots of other tools, I went through, I grabbed the source code this morning. I unzipped it. Their, their zip structure is terrible. It dumps files all over the current directory. I grepped for license, copyright, GPL, BSD, Apache. These are open source licenses. I actually have read through the code before trying to find a license. Here I ran a grep command for those. Actually, I found quite a few instances of copyright Science Applications International Corp, which is fair enough. They wrote the code. But nowhere in there did I find a license. In their documentation on the web, it says, in quotes, this is open source. That doesn't give you the right to use this code. So people like Keras are actually breaking the law right now in terms of copyright law. It's up to SAIC to prosecute if they wanted to. I don't think they want to. I mean, this is not an intentional thing going on. But if they felt like it, they could get damages from all of these companies that are using it. You have to be careful about this, and you need to think about distributing and working with people. My hope in this class is you've realized that we are an international community. We want to collaborate across countries and boundaries and companies and research places. We want to be able to collaborate. So we need to be able to give a license to our code so that we can work together. So try to avoid things like that. The community, at this point, is dependent on this code. And they're also hoping that SAIC will work with them to straighten out the licensing. But it's on nobody's radar. That's fine until a lawyer somewhere decides to make it a mess. A lot of people think that, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. But quite a few software projects over the years have been just destroyed by licensing issues. There have been 10, 15, 20 year long legal battles over software. I don't think our industry is at all interested in any of that stuff. We want to be able to work. We don't want to be fighting over legal junk. We just want to be going out there and collecting cool data and mapping the world. So I've thrown my recommendation of three common licenses that you might want to pick if you're writing some software. There's the Berkeley Standard Distribution, or BSD. That license is very flexible. It says, basically, you can do whatever you want with my code. You need to acknowledge that I wrote it. You can't use my name for advertising. And go forth and use this code. People can resell that code inside of things. So there's a lot of BSD code in all of your computers that you're using right now. It's really flexible. People can do basically whatever. The LGPL, or Lesser GNU Public License, version 3, basically says if you modify this code, you must publish the changes if you give that code to anybody else in binary or other form. So what that does is if you write a bunch of software and you want other people to contribute back to it, it says, you know, you got to play nice. You got to contribute your changes back to the, the main body. But you can put it in a commercial tool. So it could end up in Keras. And you might see that they say something like, if, if uh, something like libgsf got turned into an LGPL project, anytime the Keras folks improved GSF, it would then have to go out to the community. It's kind of a nice concept. And at the other end of the spectrum is just the GNU public license. And in that one, it says, you can use my code. If you distribute anything based on that or change that code, you have to release it. So things like closed source software like Keras 
can't use GPL-based code. It's more of a political statement in terms of you want to keep that code from going behind closed doors. I tend to favor the BSD and the LGPL licenses because they let more people collaborate on code. Oftentimes I've created GPL-based software when I'm getting going and I don't really want it to disappear into a company. I really need some collaboration and I need to guarantee that. And then later on I'll switch it to a different license to open it up once the code's a little more stable and I don't mind it sort of disappearing into a company. Yep? Is there an instance where a company would take one of these and work on it and then close it so that you can't actually work on your original code? With BSD, yes. Okay. They can make changes to it and you might not ever see those changes. If they did that with LGPL or GPL, unfortunately suing is usually the recourse that you have which is really no fun. Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> or at least nobody sane wants to do that. These are just mechanisms to communicate your intentions and hopefully people play along nicely. If you look at Google hosting, it wants me to log in, but if you take a look at this site and you log in, what it will do is show you some of the licenses that you can do. They actually restrict it to just a I think five or six different licenses. So I encourage you not to create new licenses. People, everybody who's tried that, the first couple years of iterations of lawyers working on it usually screw up a lot. Even the pros get it wrong. Working with licenses and, and legal stuff is really complicated, so don't try to create your own. Just pick one of the major ones. Wikipedia has a nice little comparison chart of going through the various licenses, who wrote them, when they've been done, and how compatible they are. Because you can create a license that is such that you can't combine that code with any other code, and that's no good. Because the reason software is powerful is that you can glue bits and pieces together and create something new. If you really care about licenses, you can go look through those, all the different options. And if you're in another country, you're going to have to uh, figure out your own situation. Yes? Yeah, well, I was just that, kind of on that note. So you're saying, like, if you work for a company and you have any questions about which one you should use, that's when you talk to your lawyer. Everything you do is owned by your company. Typically, yes. A university has some different exceptions. If you're doing something that is like a journal paper or considered a publication, then you actually at UNH own that. But yes, typically if you're at a company and you're doing something the company typically owns almost everything that you're doing, then you talk to the lawyer for the company and you negotiate how to work with the source code. So is, this, is it pretty standard then, like even if we're here mm -hmm. um, working um, to put one of these licenses on before we put it posted to a public? If you're at UNH specifically, if you're working with GPL code, the code that you write by law has to become GPL, so that's a done deal. If you're working with code and you want to release it, typically that's an issue if you have a supervisor for your supervisor to worry about. And at some point, your supervisor will end up either just checking a checkbox on the UNH policy or talking to the UNH lawyers. Mm -hmm. Typically, I consider that with UNH, it's advertising for the university. We want to be showing off the cool stuff that we do as much as possible. But it also has to be balanced with whether or not you're going to try and commercialize that code. So some of our code, really, we don't see a lot of commercial potential. Other code, they've, they've locked up pretty tight because of... So it, it's pretty confusing. It gets even worse with data licenses because people didn't think about licensing data. If I go out and collect multi-beam data, it's mine. You don't actually, if I give you the file, you don't have the rights to do anything with it. We've had instances where we've tried to give data to people and their lawyers have said, uh, you haven't given us permission to do anything. We said, well, it was collected under government funds, NSF, it's open, do whatever you want. And their lawyer said, no, we, we won't take that. You, you can't give us this data that way. We can't do anything with it. I don't actually know, I haven't seen good answers that go along with this, so I've just posted some links of things that I found. There's a Open Data Commons has the o ODBL license that's used for OpenStreetMap. That might be a solution. You can mm -hmm. use Creative Commons licenses that sort of seem to work. But again, you have to be able to give permissions for that data. And again, if you work for a company, you're company has to give you the ability to release that data under a license if somebody's going to use it. Same case goes for commercial data. If you're working at a contract firm, usually it's your contract that, that dictates that that data can be used, but oftentimes you can lock up your data so that no one can ever use it again, and that sucks. You know, if you've locked your own company out of your own data, 
that's the worst. There's different licenses for documentation and text too. We won't talk about that. If you're a US government employee, you're in this really bizarre limbo state. Just because a US government employee did it, it sometimes means that it's public domain, but oftentimes it doesn't. There's exceptions, and that rule about public domain only applies inside the United States. And it may apply elsewhere, but that's questionable. So if you're a government employee and you create something, you might actually own the copyright to that in other countries. A little bit weird. And government funding, again, like if it's NSF funded and it's supposed to be released, you may be contractually required to lease it, release it under a certain license, or you may not. It's very hard to follow these things, and we don't have good answers to what to do with this. And the contract officers don't even understand some of these rules themselves. So it's a little bit confusing. And one last copyright thing to talk about. There's a concept that very few people seem to use that I think might be a great solution for when you guys go out. You may be working in contract firms or creating contracts for contract firms to do data collection or write source code for you. You should consider things called escrow, where you basically say, hey, we're going to use a third party. We're going to put that source code or data in the store, and we'll either hang on to it for a certain number of years, say five years, and then we'll make it public domain or release it under some license. Or you can say, you know, another alternative is if you're working with people who want close, to write closed source stuff or have data that is locked up, as you can say, well, as long as you're still producing that software, company X, you know, we're, we'll work with you, but you had better put that software in escrow, and if you ever go out of business or you stop making that product, we have it for free forever. If you create licenses like that, when you're, especially if you're a big government agency creating contracts, you can put in whatever you can legally pull off in there. You can basically put protections in there such that if a company goes bankrupt, which happens, or if they get bought out by somebody who isn't interested in your product that you've been using. If you're using a multi-beam processing software and that company gets bought out for part of their technology, but maybe it's Microsoft or Google or Yahoo and they buy that and say, we don't really want that software, we're just going to kill it. What are you going to do? If that software just goes kapoof and your license keys run out, you're really in trouble. But if you can put in, in your contracts a way to say, if you ever do that, we have the software for free forever. That gives you extra protection. It may, it may be really painful to go through with that, and you may have to hire people who understand how to work with that code. But these are ways that you might be able to protect yourself a little bit more down the road. And if you're a contract firm, you want to show off what you do. But I've worked with people who have never been able to show me anything that they do except for what I paid them for, because everything else is locked up in contracts. If you want to show off how great your multi-beam data is, you could put in your license, if you can pull it off in the negotiations, hey, you know, after five years, I need to be able to show this. Let's put it in the, the World Archives and let's use this data for other stuff. But you know what? We understand that it's proprietary for the you know, X years that we need to hold on to this. So we'll set that data aside and we'll release it. So maybe 2020 that data will get released and then it will become a part of the scientific commons. But until then, we'll hold on to it. So those kinds of agreements, I don't see them happening very often but they could be really powerful and they could be a way to balance the commercial interests that you need to do with the preservation of you know, this important data. And I threw in a link from a company I know nothing about, but they're an, actually an escrow service. So you can actually contract with this company to be that third party and they're under a legal contract that they won't release whatever it is they're holding on to until certain things are met. It might be a time release or some sort of contract agreement. So those are some things to think about really not a great topic. It's not very fun. We're here to do science, not copyright law, and deal with all those kinds of issues. But if we don't deal with them, we can get ourselves really stuck. I've written actually a lot of source code that will never be legally releasable because of these issues. They were written at a government facility as a contractor, and things are so confused that nobody knows how to release that code legally. And if we'd done that beforehand, we might have had a chance and it wouldn't have been a big deal. So enough copyright stuff. This is my sad list of things that I wanted to show you guys that I think are really cool that you'll have to come back hopefully for some videos later on. One of them does have a video. So we've used Mercurial just to check out the class notes. In there I've gone through the basics of creating a Mercurial project. It's a, 
about 35 minutes where I show you just a tiny little bit of material. There's a lot more to it and 35 minutes is not enough to really get you guys deeply involved with it. I was hoping to pull it off throughout the whole semester but I realized pretty quickly that we, we covered a lot of material and I think you guys did pretty well covering it for how much we did but you know, you'd always like to have more in there and it takes time to get used to things like revision control and how do you work with stuff. I, I thought it would be really cool because we have 16 students plus a couple of auditors here. We could have done commits and merge and have a document that we all created together, which was my hope, but trying to create a new class and work that in, it would have just been too much. So I didn't go for it. I'm, I'm sorry. GeoMap app is a great tool for finding data. Maybe I can convince the GeoMap app team at Lamont Doherty to to make a video themselves. Normally we get Andrew Goodwillie from their team to come up and give a great seminar, but we were just jam-packed full of material. So these things didn't quite make it. I feel like what we've gone through has been more of the basics, building a foundation, and these are the things that you guys are now ready to dig into and really get to know. So I'm hoping that you guys feel more comfortable going out and learning about these, these tools using you know, Google Earth, NASA WorldWind, Collecting data with Python using PySerial to talk to serial ports. I was hoping to do that. Uh, we have some people here at CECOM who are very good at that. Roland is uh, especially notable for doing data logging with Python. Uh, projecting and processing data with Proj and GDAL. You guys saw them very briefly, but we missed a lot of the, the capabilities. Using Python to get data into MATLAB and ArcGIS, Keras, HiPack, Flatermouse, GMT. It's a great glue language for sticking things together. So even though some of these tools don't have Python built in, you can still, for example, work with Flatermouse. You can take your data and get it in the form that Flatermouse wants. A lot of times just having that little bit of quick scripting in there will take things and convert them around. And one huge thing that I'm very sorry I missed was I planned to do tied data processing. And Ben Smith has written all kinds of tools to help you guys out with your summer hydro project. And I didn't cover them, I'm really sorry. But Python is a great way to quickly process millions of data points. You don't have to bring them into Excel and try to suffer through the multiple spreadsheet thing. And in past classes, we've actually, or past years, the students have used Python to process the data from the Tide Station and raw engineering units and get it ready and do the averaging to get to the six minute form that's needed by Keras to meet the NOAA standards and do your hydrographic survey. So I'm hoping to be able to pull that off in the next six months and leave you guys with a video from the West Coast to do that, but I'm not sure I'll get to do it. But Ben is still in the building, so I would highly recommend talking to Ben about his Tide tools before you get near Summer Hydro. So that's what I didn't cover. I'm very sorry, I apologize profusely. Let's go do some more Python. We've got a little bit of time, and let's jump in, and give it a go. So we'll dig in here. Hopefully you guys still have RT update, which will do your mercurial update, which you guys probably already did before you came in the room, before I got in. And so there probably will be no updates available. If your alias doesn't work, I've actually put in a command that will do the same thing. It CDs into the research tools directory, does an HD pull and an HD update. So let's go ahead and get ourselves into a directory where we can work with this stuff. So make dir tilde slash class 26, if you haven't already done that. I've already got it. cd tilde slash class 26, pwd. I was in the wrong directory, which is good that I did that command and actually followed the notes. If you want to create a bookmark for it, we can bookmark c26. And just to make sure, bookmark dash l. You can see we've got a class 24 and a class 26 bookmark. Yet again, since the power in this building likes to hiccup, log start dash o dash r log class 26 dot pi. So now you should have a log file. We're sort of back to where we were. Let's go grab our SBET files again. You guys should be tired of hearing me talk about curl and wget. So paste that in, edit, copy, Edit, paste. So now if we do an ls-l, you'll see there should be some bzip files. We can b-unzip with those three commands. 
And if we do an ls-l again, you should see that we've got our three sbets to play with. Rather than copying and pasting in some giant Python file, this is going to get you exactly the code that I had last time. So if you do this copy, this will copy it from the Mercurial repository. And go ahead and open up that file. Control X, Control F, tilde slash class 26, sbet.py. And we're back to working on decoding a Planix pause pack sbet IMU binary data files. So we were working on KML two classes ago. We'd written a quick script to do it, but we had some data points in our sbet files that were at 0, 0, that great garbage dump where dead data likes to go. And we wanted to get those out of our data. So we need to add some code in there that will actually remove those 0, 0 points. As we're reading through the data, we want to skip anything that's right around 0, 0. If you're ever a surveyor at 0, 0, let me know how that goes. If you run a multi-beam survey across there, I bet all kinds of software will crash and freak out. We have a lot of, we've had a lot of problems going across the date line or the uh, zero or longitude. I definitely, we had a research cruise that went back and forth across the date line down by Antarctica, and every time we did that, the IMU crashed. It was really unfun. And if there's one lesson this class should teach you is ask questions often and always be aggressive about getting help when you get stuck. Otherwise, things get harder and harder as you go down without having asked the question. So the first thing we need to do is we have floating point numbers. And those are trouble because a floating point number doesn't always equal the same floating point number because of rounding problems. So to be safe, I've created this function called almost equal that will basically look for a range around a point. So if we were comparing for a number here, you have an epsilon that you can be either side of. If you're in this range, and this is your point, if you compare a number and they match within that tolerance, then you consider those numbers the same. And in Python, there's actually an epsilon given to you that they think is good. So we'll say import sys and sys.float info. Inside there is Epsilon, if you hit enter after importing sys, you'll get what the Python folks felt an epsilon should be on this computer. You can always pick your own, but this is one that seems to work pretty well. We just want a function that does this comparison, but lets it be sloppy. So if you're close to zero, but not exactly at it, you should basically consider yourself at zero. So this function I've written right here will compare two values and use an epsilon. So it'll look if the value is greater than value 2 plus epsilon. It'll say, nope, these aren't the same. If the value is less than the second value minus epsilon, return false. Otherwise, say, yep, they're pretty much the same. So these are the kinds of things that you create functions for in Python. It encapsulated some little idea that, you know, you could put this in your code every time you need to compare, but you'll go a little crazy. So if we just copy this code, meta w, Get us going, and we'll put that right below the from pprint import pprint and above the field names. Yank, save that. Now we need to go and use that code inside of our loop where we were looking at the datagrams. So we actually need to use that almost equal down in our function that we were working on. And I haven't looked at this since last time, so I'll be a little surprised when I see the code. I haven't looked at it for two weeks. So inside of our for datagram, so here's what we're looking for. We're trying to find the beginning of our for loop where we looped over the data. So it's in your load sbet file function. And if you go up here and select load sbet file, it'll jump you right to that function. Or you can do like a control S and search for the for datagram. So let's go take a look in there. And what we need to do is add this almost equals in here. Uh-oh, am I looking in the wrong place then? Yep, we can do it in the main. Oh boy, this is what happens when you haven't looked at the uh, example in a little bit. So we'll probably want that in both places, but we'll do it in the main for now. Yep, good catch. So search for the main. So you can go I am Python main, and inside of main, so we had four datagram and index, and right here we have an out.write where we wrote out a line for our data. So right there, 
should be about line 314. If you look right here, the line number, you can search for line 314. So we'll go ahead and add that in. So if almost equal 0 point comma nrx almost equal ah oh, yes <laughs> oh does it it oh shoot that's not good because we all have different yeah so let me take a quick peek and see make sure you're in main because it's how because remember we did some people the way they wrap their text i say the bug in emacs i don't like the line numbers change that's not good good call so line numbers are not helpful in that case. Line wrapping in buffer, wrap it window edge, truncate. Oh dear. So go into main and find that. <laughs> so you're looking for the four datagram index inside of main. Hopefully that can get you to the right spot. I don't know why your colors are really messed up. Yeah, I'm wondering if you have a quote that didn't finish right. Did have you? Oh, I put some quotes. So you got three quotes, that looks good. You need to get rid of those three quotes right there. All three of them? Yes. So what you did is you had triple quote, ending triple quote, and you started another oh, multi-line quote. You just quoted your entire file. <laughs> and that's a good one. Those are, yeah, those are hard to figure out. So zero, point, comma, and Y. So what we've done is said, if we're right about zero, zero, we want to just skip that point. We don't want to write it out. So we can say continue. And that continue is going to jump back up to the top of the for loop and keep going. So if we save that and we try it, hopefully we'll be able to write out a KML that actually makes sense. And you guys can copy that to your desktop and view a KML of where this SBET file is. So the troublesome one was, I believe, the 2011 data. So if we say run sbet.py and 2011 sbet. Hopefully, but what we can do is dash dash help. So we just specify the file names. So this is the great thing about having help written into your code. When you haven't used it in a little bit, you might forget your own code. So we can say 2011, press tab. It should list out your SBET. Where in there did, uh, did that help you, the help file like I'm looking? Where did the help come from? Well, I remember where it came from, but uh, like, what did you look for? that you said helped you, like where to put the file name? So I looked in here and yeah. there was only a dash H option mm -hmm. and then we specify file names. Okay. So not a lot to do. This is a pretty boring one. In this class, I should have guessed that it probably was pretty, pretty mild in terms of what it's doing, but I often write code with like 80 million options and then I have to remember how to use them. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to run it and we'll see if it explodes. Awesome, it's completely unhappy. So I'll show you a little bit of debugging. Yeah, it's not supposed to work. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> yes, correct. So what I've done is I looked at this code below and there was X and Y, or I was looking at my example in the notes, which is actually pointing to the wrong place. And in this context, datagram long and datagram lat, we need to follow the same pattern as is right below it. Here we had an X and Y defined. But what we need to do is replace that. We can actually just steal these two guys. Meta W, and we can just say, put it right up at the beginning of the loop. If I paste this, and I say datagram X equals long degree. So what we can do is pull those two variables out as X and Y. It's a style thing how you play this, whether you want to put datagram long, datagram degrees down here in your code, but that should work. And if I rerun this, it should go. So I added those two lines. Um, so what you may be doing is you're writing, you've got a version that you've written, and you're working on two different files in different locations, and you're having a version skew problem. Oh. So one's in a different so place. Can I delete it? Do a control X B real quick, and we'll get, well, other people are working on catching up. We'll, okay, now control X and then a K. Yeah. And then I'll kill the buffer. Oh, yeah. Press enter. And then do a file save as. And just make it. And make sure it's, yeah, move that to class 26. So you've been editing a file that isn't the one you're running. Uh, I think you had a CD issue, like you just had a skew of where you were at one point. Okay. If you wanted to not show the zero, zero ones. Oh, just the visualization. 
Not yeah, let me. I'll, that's a great question. I'll show you why that's happening. It's uh, so if you look in your printout, you're actually still seeing zero zeros here. Yeah. A little surprising, huh? Doesn't make a lot of sense. If you look at where our continue is, here's our check for continuing. And here we use that mod operator to print out every 20th datagram to the screen. If we move that, so control space, go down two lines, control W. If we put that right above it, so if we yank that with control Y, and we switch the order so that we do the test before we do that printout, and we rerun our script, any line that was zero, zero disappears. Does that make a little more sense? Now if we do an ls-l, we'll see that there should be a KML file somewhere here. And since it's wrapping, it's a little hard to see. So if we do a less 2011 tab, and it'll write out to, to the point where it shows the sbet, but then we also have an sbet.kml. It's what I have editing for in Audacity. <laughs> That's why I edit all classes before they go out, don't worry. So do a less of that KML file, and you should now see inside of your coordinates, you should see a bunch of coordinates listed out, and a greater than will take you to the bottom of the file in less, and then you can type Q to quit out. And now if you want to see that, you can copy it over to the window side because Google Earth is a little bit clunky. So what you can do is copy 2011, sbet KML, like that. And if we throw it in our Dropbox, you can go back to your Dropbox. So how many of you have forgotten your Dropbox password since last time we used it? I have nothing Saved in my, my KML file. You have nothing in your KML file, okay. Uh, oh yeah, there is nothing in your KML I'm file. You <laughs> 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 um, so do a control X1 and let's take a look at your uh, script. So go to your main function. So typically with Python, you can get in easy trouble with indenting. So take a look, see how I have my X and Y datagram up on the screen on mine. And then right below it, I have the if almost equals. Notice that the indenting for me is in the same column. So this guy is back indented, so it breaks the for loop. So go hit tab. Go down to your almost equals and tab that in one more. And then delete, backspace one. So see how that now is under the same? And then you put a continue on the next line between the if and the out. Do you yeah. see how that's working? Yeah, I saw it earlier. I had a, um, it's, I had, I was copying and pasting, I was yanking and. Yep, it screwed well, up know, all the indenting. So I spent, yeah, and so then I spent a lot that. of time trying to fix the indent and I didn't. Yeah, the tab key so, helps and you can hit, just keep hitting tab and it will help sort of recycle things through. And it's hard to learn how to read the indenting and once you get used to it, you'll start picking it up, but. I should have put an error in the card. So try to run it again. Mm -hmm. So if I copied it, I'm going to overwrite one that I already have there. So yes, and I'm going to switch out of this to Python and open tilde slash Dropbox 2011 underscore. And hopefully Dropbox has automatically synced everything. We go back to Norfolk and we mow the lawn. For those of you who don't know the term mowing the lawn, this is typically the pattern you do when you're surveying to, to get full coverage. And it's the same thing you do when you go out and deal with the grass in your yard. So you call it mowing the lawn. Now, in order to use Google Earth, we need to use it from Windows. Okay. So rather than inside the virtual machine, you want to be using IE or Firefox on Windows. And then going into your Dropbox account and getting the, the KML file from your Dropbox account. So I'm going to split my window and go back to the notes. So that's great that we have a KML file. Databases. How do you guys want to do databases in 15 minutes? It's a bummer because this is a really great topic, but it really deserves like a couple classes rather than just a couple minutes. I want to at least have you see doing some database work, even if we don't get very much done. I'll just show you a little bit about databases. Think of it as kind of like a spreadsheet, but way more programmable. It works more like coding, where spreadsheets are really not coding in the normal sense. You know, things can disappear behind one of your squares in a spreadsheet. With databases, it works on tables. That's sort of like in a spreadsheet world, that might be one of your tabs. And we can say create table. I have a little if not exists, so if you run it a second time, your table doesn't 
get upset that it's trying to create the same table. And I have a table name called SBET Entry. As typical with most programming languages, you can a lot of the stuff that you're doing is just mentally translating between the vocabulary in one and the vocabulary in another. It's hopefully easier than learning a foreign language, but it kind of is a similar concept of foreign languages where you're just switching the vocabulary. The vocabulary change we have here is that these are our variable names that we're going to have in each row in our big table. We call them doubles or floats in other spaces. If we're in Python or C or some other language, uh, floating point numbers in databases are referred to as real. It's sort of vocabulary that comes from Fortran in the 1950s. It's a real number, I guess, is, is a mathematical term. I like floating point. but So these are all reals. You can have lots of other data types. You can have strings, and you can have all sorts of different things in here. But we just are going to have a bunch of floating point numbers in each row. And we can then insert rows into that database. And then we can view them in Firefox. Because Firefox has a nice little plugin that makes it look like a spreadsheet, and it's talking to a database. So I'm going to go ahead and add creation to of an SQLite database to our script. I'm going to go pretty fast, try and at least show it to you. So I'm going to create a function that goes through and creates, takes an SBET file, and it will actually write out that SBET file to a database. So let me walk you through really quick what's here. But I'll copy it into the code so we can actually see it highlighted in Python. So I'm going to go right above the main, paste that in. And there's some funny terminology inside of databases that you have to get used to. The first one is we're going to grab the module that knows how to talk to a database. For each database type, there's typically a, a module that goes with it. There's lots of different databases. There's SQLite is a simple one. There's Postgres. There's MySQL. There's Microsoft Access and SQL Server. They go on and on. There's, you might have heard of Oracle, things like that. We're going to use one that's built into Python, so SQLite. The nice thing about SQLite is the database is just a file. So with some of the other ones, they're complicated. They have some big server, and you want to pay a very expensive person a giant salary to maintain your database if you use Oracle. But SQLite is a great way to start. It's super simple compared to the other ones. The first thing you do with the database is you connect to it. So we'll say SQLite 3, and the 3 meaning the version 3 of SQLite and connect to a database, and then the file name. And that'll create a file in the directory that'll be our database. We're going to create the table. And we're just going to work with a couple variables. We didn't really need to worry about all the rest of them. If we just want to display like the x, y, and z of our ship and know the time it was, we can ignore the rest of this. So you say create table if exists, and then our table name, so sbet entry. And we're just going to have time, y, x, z, and x velocity. It's going to drive me crazy that it's y, x, but I'll live. This was our generator that returns a datagram each time it loops through our file. And we're going to use the enumerate to give a number for each one. So we have our datagram index that is going to get that enumerated count. So the number will keep going up each time through. The datagram is going to get a, a dictionary back from our load sbet file for each datagram. In database languages, you execute commands. And one of the commands that you can do is insert into, which basically creates a new row in this table. You, tell it, you have to actually tell it which parts of that row you want to add to. So time, x, y, z. Uh-oh. So I've got y, x. Let's make sure this is all right. I've swapped it because I write x, y, z. So this has to then, in values, match. So time, this would be x, y. OK, it looks good. And then altitude is our z. And then you pass it this dictionary. So this is kind of doing a funky lookup, where if you put a colon and then the name inside of your dictionary that you're getting back, it'll go and look up that dictionary value and insert it into here. It's kind of a common theme in Python, being able to look up things by name so you don't have to know that it's like the third entry in there. And then there's a weird concept in databases where you commit, which basically means you're working on the database. And until you say commit, it won't actually save that. I don't know how many times that I've worked really hard, created some code, and then I look at the results in the database and there's nothing in it because I forgot the commit. I always forget. So that's our code to create this database. And we're going to go ahead and add an option into our command line parser that we can say dash dash SQLite and it will write an SQLite database for us.
So that's a lot in a couple minutes, but hopefully that gives you just a sense and a flavor of databases. So I'm going to go back to the notes. In here it says add this to the main function, so we're going to add a command line option. So I'm inside of main. Here I've created this parser that is our command line thing, and we haven't had any real options. We've just used it to grab our file names. We can add another option in here. So we can say parser dot add argument dash dash sqlite. There's lots of different types of arguments. You can have like a true false that if you see that flag, it'll record that it saw it, or you can actually have numbers in there that it'll do. We can then say action equals store true, and then we can say the default is false. So that what will happen is when we run our command line arguments, it'll default to being false that we want to generate an SQLite file, but if we specify dash dash SQLite, <laughs> that'll become true, and then we can test that later on and write the database. So now if we say run sbet.py dash dash help, we'll see if my code blows up, if I've made any typos again this time. And I haven't. And what we've got here is another option down there that says dash dash SQLite, and I didn't give it any help, so that's not very nice. So we'll say comma help equals write a SQLite database and the string. Save that. So now if we do help, we have a new option, dash dash write SQLite database. Let's be brave and try to run it. So we'll say run and then control R to search back through our history. Here's the one I had before, so then I can say dash dash SQLite, please write me a database. And I'm going to press enter. It runs really fast, great. Do you think there will be a database file waiting for us? There should be an SQLite file somewhere in here, and I don't see one. We uh, didn't do anything with that command line argument that we had, so we actually have to glue the two together. So if we take a look here, in the for loop, we have some code here that will go through as we're looping through our file names and actually call our sbet to sqlite function. So let's go add that into our for loop for each file. So here we have our for file name. So right after that for loop, we can say if args.sqlite, if that's true, we want to write an sbet to an SQLite, SQL, file name, file name, plus, and then, so to not overwrite my data file, which I've done too many times, we'll add on an extension to that, so .sqlite, save it. So for every time we have a file, if we have that argument be true, we can then write out a file. And to also help ourselves, so here we printed out the file names. Why don't we just print out print SQLite question mark comma args dot SQLite. Why did we do that? So what I wanted to do is just show you, you should see a true or false coming out. So if we run it without the dash dash SQLite, right up here you'll see SQLite false. So nope, didn't want to write an SQLite. We do it one more time with the dash dash sqlite, we'll see a true, mm -hmm. and hopefully it called that function and wrote out something. And there it is. So if we say bang to run a shell command, file 2011 sbet.sqlite, it actually knows this is an sqlite 3.x database. That's great. Now we want to look at it. That might be nice. Actually look at our data. Firefox actually has a nice plugin for it. And is it installed? Yep. So if you don't have SQLite Manager installed, you would go to add-ons, get add-ons, search for SQLite. It works away. And your list should be different because I already have it installed. So it should actually be the first option in here. So up in the top right, on the, next to this tools, this is the search window. Just type SQLite up in the top right. And the very first option that shows up, if you don't have it installed, is SQLite Manager. Go ahead and hit Install over here for that option. I see a number of you have got it up there, and 
So just click install next to it and go through the process to install it. And then you have to restart Firefox. That's a common problem with plugins is you give it a go, you think you've installed it, it nothing's there. It doesn't do anything. You have to actually restart Firefox. And then we do tools, SQLite manager, and it's unhappy about something because I was looking at an old database that doesn't exist. You won't see that, I hope. So now there's a couple options up here. Let's refresh. This is new database. If you want to create a database here, it'll help you build a database. Connect to database. That's what I actually want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to this guy. <coughs> and now I'm facing a directory tree full of stuff. I want to go down to class. Let's see, let's switch by name. I see class right there. Uh, we got a lot of classes now, so class 26. And it's only going to show you things that end in .sqlite. If you don't have that, you can select all <coughs> files. I'm going to click open. That doesn't look like what we wanted. Now what you actually have to do is you have to go into tables for the database because there might be many tables, so it doesn't know which one to show you. Inside there is SBET entry. It'll show you the rows that are in there. If you select that, here are your database rows. And you can sort on you know, any column as a typical in a sort of a spreadsheet setup. And your data is in there. So now if you want to take a look at that data in a more spreadsheet form, you've actually got a way to play with it. And you can actually execute and try out commands. And if you want to learn SQL, this is not a bad place to try it. If you generate or find a, an SQLite database, you can try some commands. So from SBET entry, and I know that limit specifies how many I print out. And hopefully if I say run, we get 10 rows back. So that's one example of using an SQL command to return stuff. So select star, it says give me everything from this table. And if we only want to see x comma y, we'll say run SQL and it gives us x comma y. And that is not enough about databases to really feel comfortable with it, but at least a hint as to where to start. And the great thing about databases is there's named columns. If you're working with someone, you can just send that file. So here was an SQLite file. You can just zip that up or compress it somehow, stick it on an email, send it to somebody, drop it on an FTP server, and you transfer the data and they'll know the names of the tables because they can see it in this tool. So if there were multiple tables, they could just click mm -hmm. on each of them. They'll know the, the names of the columns. With our SBET file, the raw data, we had to be able to write a parser. We had to know it was an SBET. If someone just gave you a file called foo that happened to be an SBET, if you weren't familiar with SBETs, you're kind of out of luck. There's no way to guess from an SBET file really that it's an SBET file. It's just full of binary data. It's very uniform floating point numbers. It could be almost anything in there if you didn't know what it was. So this way, when somebody sends you an SQLite file, you just open it up here and you can see the data and get a sense for it right away. There's no like, I gotta go write some crazy parser and use the struct command to parse binary data. And hopefully there's a specification somewhere on the web that I can find to define the format. And three days later, you can sort of read the data. Here, you can see it. You can decide, I do or I don't want to use this. It helps me or doesn't help me with my project. And we're good to go. So that's databases in, uh, I think we spent 15 minutes or 12 minutes there. Way too fast. And so there's actually some documentation in the general directory on the web page for the class. That will be it for research tools. I hope this has been helpful to you guys. It's been a ton of material. I'm sure it's leaking out your ears about now and you're about to go into finals. But the, the material is still here. Feel free to copy that. I will try to make a zip of the whole class that you can just download. It'll be a couple hundred megabytes, but you'll be able to download the videos, the audio, and all the class notes just in one file. And if you're gonna go to C, just grab that file, take it with you if you, the material's helpful, and you can work through it at your own pace. All right, guys, welcome to CCOM. That's research tools. Go forth and research. Thank you. Good. Your last homework is going to be homework five, and I'll put up a post. Homework four, I asked you guys to turn one in a while back, and you all did. The last one, it'll be just a homework five directory. I'll put up a, an org file that just goes through the instructions again, really simply, and it'll be on the research tools computer. So there should be an entry for every day in that file up through today, and then that's the end. Now, it's not every day of the week. That's just days we had class.